and it's my privilege to introduce Dr. Lisa Bosma, who's going to be giving her presentation on solar energy. Uh, Dr. Bosman recently received her PhD from the University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, and she took third place um, in uh, engineering research, and that was at a Montreal conference. Mm -hmm. She's been working at CMN for about 3.5 years. <laughs> she is engineering way of working. Um, and she teaches a variety of uh, math and um, engineering courses. She has four students that are working on solar research with her um, on this and other projects. Mm -hmm. um, so the students are getting a lot of good research background has done a great deal of work for us is um, with her expertise she's brought in nearly a half a million dollars in grant funds and that's how we have 60 solar panels mm -hmm. uh, on the roof of this building mm -hmm. that you'll get a look at so without further ado um, Dr. Bosman <coughs> Thank you and good morning. So today I'm gonna to be talking about solar energy and some of this, I am a recent uh, PhD student. Some of this is an extension from my research but it fits really well with what we're doing here at the college. So first of all, just to talk about this specific grant and this is through NASA and it's called the NICE grant, NASA Innovations in Climate Education. And the total for this grant is $413,000 across three years. And there's two main objectives. The first main objective is focusing on curriculum development, so infusing STEM concepts with climate change literacy. The second one, which is going to be the focus of the talk today, is on the research that we're doing. So that involves four to six STEM students, and this is exactly what we put in the grant, to create a user-friendly solar energy system evaluation tool. So two of those students are here today, Apollonia Gomez and Travis Spice, and then we have two other students, Lincoln Peters and Lloyd Friesian. So just to put it into perspective, motivation, why is solar energy research so important? Well, when we look at the global energy consumption, and we look at the year 2030, it's kind of small here, but we can see the total predicted in terawatts is 23 terawatts, and this is the global energy uh, consumption predict predicted for 2030. When we look at the incoming solar energy, so from the sun, this is everything incoming, what we want to focus on is what's being reflected, and that's about 7,000 terawatts. And we want to focus on what's being absorbed by the land and oceans, because this is what's actually usable for solar energy or for photovoltaic for creating solar electricity. Taking that into consideration, if we focus on the sunlight of the land area, because clearly we're not going to put solar panels all over the ocean, that's a little bit difficult. If we just focus on the land area, we're limited to 29.2% of the Earth, which brings our available usable solar energy down to 28,000 terawatts. Still a lot. Realistically, we're not going to put solar panels over the entire land area, so if we just focus on 2% of the land area, that brings us down to 560 terawatts, still a lot. But knowing that energy isn't very efficient, currently solar energy is at about a 12% efficiency, that brings us to 67 terawatts. So even taking that into consideration, that's going to be more than double what's needed predicted for the year 2030. So there's a whole lot of potential with solar energy, and that's why solar energy research is so important. So that's looking at the global level. If we bring it down to the U.S., this map here is of the tribal land's energy potential. And if you can't see it up here, the darker we get, so the more maroon colors around this area, is higher solar radiation content. And if you look at all these little yellow boxes, these are all the tribal lands throughout the U.S., Menominee being right up there. So if we just focus on the tribal lands and strictly 5% of tribal lands, that alone can provide 17,600 billion kilowatts per year in energy potential. So what does this really mean? In our average size American homes, 1,600 square feet, on average we spend 9,500 kilowatts per year in electricity. In a larger home, a mega home, up to 24,500, but what this means is that for these average size homes, we can provide electricity for 1.8 billion average sized homes. So there's a lot of potential not only within 
the global perspective, but just looking at tribal reservations and focusing on that area. Continued motivation for solar energy research is that the government is all about it. So DOE, Department of Energy, they have this Sunshot Initiative that aims to reduce the installed cost of solar technologies by 75%. So starting in 2010, we're at 21.4 cents per kilowatt hour. As of 2013, we're down to 11.2 cents, and our goal is this dotted line here, 6 cents. So we're well on our way, but the government understands the importance of it, energy independence. So not only at a, a federal level, it's something that we need to think about at a more local level as well. Additional motivation, most of the real world performance facilities are in the solar intense areas. So NREL is located in Colorado. We have Sandia National Labs out of New Mexico and Florida Solar Energy Center. These are the main uh, performance facilities within the US. And as you can see, according to this guide here, these are very solar intense areas. But there's also different climatic factors in that area. Um, less cold weather, like in the US, and less um, snow. So that's why the College of Nomination, as well as our partner, Argonne National Laboratory, we really have something to add to this because we have different climatic factors going on in our area. So that's our main partner in this, Argonne National Laboratory. We're analyzing their data as well as the data that we have collected right here. The last motivation for this is that practically speaking, we can better understand PV performance and valuation with respect to the multiple stakeholders such as contractors, insurance appraisers, and homeowners with performance warranty and value expectations. So let's say you install some solar panels on your house. 10 years later, you want to sell it. So what is it worth? What value does it add to your house? And does the value change over time? Or let's say a tornado comes through some other natural disaster and it rips the panels off the house. So from an insurance perspective, what's the value of these solar panels? And is the value different from year two to year 25? So as you can imagine, if you have a car and you have an insurance on your car, depending on the price of the car, there's lots of information about there about the insurance perspective and even if you want to sell it, like kellybluebook.com. So what we're trying to do is create a Kelly Blue Book for solar panels. So over time, what is the worth of these solar panels? To get started in this, and as part of this research objective, these are all the different tools that are currently available. So these are free online, and as you can imagine, we're not the first ones to come up with this idea of valuing solar energy. So all these different models are created, and what's interesting about several of the models is that they all use this PV watts as an input into their valuation system. So in general, PV watts is a standard um, that's available as a, as a solar energy calculator. And this is available through the NREL website. But when we look at these, there's a lot of deficiencies, not only with PV watts, but within several of these tools. And that's what I'm gonna go into next, is what are some of the limitations and where can we fill in the gaps? The first limitation is they have limited system configurations. So the main configuration for solar panels are the grid tied, and that's what we have going on here. So we're linked directly into the grid. Any energy that we don't use, we can sell back to the grid and get a credit for. But these applications, they don't consider the off-grid. So for example, if you have a cabin up north and you have a battery-based system, there currently is no calculator available to predict what the cost is associated with the off-grid system. So even though the primary market is grid-tied, we have to take into consideration that there are other configurations that are of importance. The next limitation is that they're lacking a monthly D-rate factor. So the D-rate means where we're D-rating the efficiency, so it's bringing the efficiency down. This example shows, at least in Wisconsin, that certain months it snows and other months it does not snow. So currently the applications just have one D-rate factor for the whole year. And so it's not realistic to estimate that we have snow throughout the whole year because we only have it during certain months. So there's certain D-rate information that, are, that should be considered on a monthly basis, but they're not. The next is that there's an incomplete annual degradation by component. 
So degradation takes it into consideration age. So we know that over time, things just naturally wear. But solar panels, the typical warranty is 25 to 30 years. An inverter, which converts electricity from DC to usable AC, at least for the homes, can vary from five to 25 years. But in most of these systems, there's just one input for age. But when you have several different components involved in the system, it's important to know the age of the different components. The fourth thing is that the current applications are restricted PV technology and they're restricted to the crystalline silicon. So the crystalline silicon is the most common out in the marketplace. It is the highest performing, so it's the best bang for the buck. But there are new technologies that are coming into play, these thin film, they have different be benefits. Um, some are more flexible applications like this amorphous silicon can be used for a more flexible application. It's currently being sewn into umbrellas, so at an eatery area. There's also this copper indium gallium selenide, also known as SIGs, and it uses cylindrical panels. So if you look up at these lights, they look exactly like this. They can collect sunlight at different geometries, but it's still more expensive um, cost per watt than the crystalline silicon. And then there's the cal cadmium telluride. So there's all these different technologies, but current applications only allow us to consider the crystalline silicon. Next, current applications just have flat panel. So the flat panel I just showed you in the last application, that SIGS is a type of cylindrical tubes. So because they have a different geometry, they collect more light earlier in the day and then they collect more light later in the afternoon. And so they perform actually better than the flat panel. So that's just something to take into consideration that if these do get heavy onto the market, how can we add that into the application? The sixth one, inability to modify the temperature coefficient. So a temperature coefficient is this number right here, and it's a negative because as temperature increases, solar power decreases. So in this example, showing that the rating is 225 watts, considering a temperature coefficient of negative 0.46, at five degrees temperature, five degrees Celsius, when it's colder, it performs better than at 45 degrees Celsius. So it's kind of like we want the sunlight out because the sunlight is going to increase our energy, but at the same time, that heat is going to slightly lower it down. So it's kind of like there's some, some fighting forces here. But it's something to take into consideration that this depends very much on the technology and the manufacturing setting. So if we can change it, we should be able to. Next is the albedo coefficient. So albedo coefficient considers the reflected radiation. And this is highly dependent on what's in front of the solar panels. So as you can imagine, if there's fresh snow in front of the solar panels, and I think I have some values, if there's some fresh snow, it's going to be very high, 0.82, because the reflection of the snow on the solar panels is a benefit. Uh, if we have something like grass, Grass is not a very good reflector, and it's at about 0.15 to 0.25. So if we can state what is in front of our solar panels, then we can get a better estimate of what we can expect uh, for the performance of the solar panels. Another limitation is that there's insufficient inverter selection. So typically, all these applications only offer a centralized inverter system. So again, the purpose of the inverter is to convert electricity from <coughs> DC direct current to AC, or alternating current. In this example of a centralized inverter system, all of these panels are strung together so that the performance of one panel, if we get shading on one panel, it's going to affect the performance of all the panels. So essentially in the central inverter system, it performs to the lowest panel. In a micro inverter system, each panel has its own inverter or a micro inverter. So if one system is performing low because of shading, it has no impact on the other systems. So this traditional use is a centralized inverter system, and these micro-inverters are new inverters that have come out. They're quite a bit more expensive than the central inverter systems, but it's good to have that option in an application because it's going to change the efficiency, as you can see here. Another limitation is it's incapable of project comparison. 
So let's say you're wondering, should I install a panel on a Wisconsin east facing roof at 45 degrees or should I install panels on Wisconsin south facing roof at 30 degrees or should I just go to my home in Florida and install a one axis pole mount on a second home in Florida? <coughs> so currently the applications, you can only look at one system at a time. So it's nice if you have multiple options to look at them side by side to see what the optimal solution is. And then lastly, the last limitation is that it's insufficient valuation techniques. And this comes back to the insurance appraiser and the real estate perspective. And it's insufficient because of all these previous limitations that we mentioned. So first of all, we're not correctly, or to the best of our ability, calculating the performance. And if we can accurately calculate performance, then we can do a much better job at valuation. So, the model, or our conceptual IPO, input processing and output model, looks like this. And this is just like an application that you might use, that the user enters the module and system information, there's processing, and this is where NASA comes in because we're using the NASA weather and solar radiation data sets. And then there's the output, which shows the expected system performance and valuation over the lifetime or remaining life. And we have feedback loops in here at all stages, and that's where Argonne National Laboratory and College of Men Menominee Nation comes in, is that we want to verify that our system is working correctly. And we can do that with our panels. So, this is going to be as nerdy as it gets, I promise. We'll quickly go through these. So this, these are all the, the formulas and models that go into the mathematical deterministic modeling. There's formulas on the module radiance, temperature, whether it's a flat panel or a cylindrical panel, because we know cylindrical panel works differently and calculates or uh, collects sun differently. There's system D rate that we need to take into consideration, degradation, and then finally we have our system performance. Done. Okay. So this is, this is, um, our preliminary results. So in order to go after a research grant, we all have these great ideas, but they like to see where are you at right now? Let's, you know, you need to have some preliminary results to show that you have something that can be brought out of this. This is just through, there's day one through 25, 26 through 50, so there's 50 days worth of data. And this is comparing this new model, so the last three slides with all these different calculations. It's comparing that to the PV watts. Now PV watts has a default, and then there's PV watts that you can adjust. Same thing with our model, there's a default, and there's adjusted. So this is just showing for 50 days, but in those 50 days, the new model outperforms the PV watts. So this is a mean square error, so on a statistical term, higher mean square error is, be is bad, so the lower we can get that error, the better. And the new model, both the default and adjusted, perform better than PV wads. But it's just for 50 days. So it's not going to stand up in any publication because we need to see the long-term effects of it, see any seasonal effects, um, as well as annual effects. So this is where the research approach comes in with the students that we're working with. So our goals for year one is to complete a literature review on the different solar energy performance valuation applications, including the pros and cons of each. And our goal for year one, and that's starting in August through about May or June, is to analyze the data comparing the performance predicted by these other applications and comparing it to our own data. So not only PV watts, but all these other systems, we want to compare it to our data, but not only for 50 days, we want to get a whole year's worth of data. In year two, our goal is to identify gaps. So where, beyond the ones that we've already presented, where else can we fill in and we need to develop models and formulas. So it's easy to point out how things are wrong, but unless you can come up with a solution on how to fix it, that's one of our goals for year two. And then we want to continue to analyze the data comparing the predicted to the actual to see if over the months, seasons, years, if there's any changes. And then our goals for year three, that's where the programming comes into play. And we're actually going to build a new system, a new application. And so we're going to create, building on what we've learned in the first two years, 
We're going to incorporate the NASA weather and climate data sets. And then again, we're going to continue to analyze the data to ensure that it's uh, responding the way that we expect it to. Our communication goals. We have traditional research outlets, so we're going to submit an article to a peer-reviewed journal. We're going to do a poster and oral presentation, and that's going to be at the Association for Environmental Studies and Sciences in June in San Diego. And then I think what's really neat for this project is that we can do non-traditional research outlets. So we're going to be doing a one-act play. My students may not know that yet, but <laughs> you, guys will be, you guys will be great. You'll be really great. Um, we're going to do a one-act play at the AHAC conference in March. And then we're going to create, uh, do additional creative artifacts, depending on the talents that we can pull out of those students to see what else we can do. And it might be a graphic novel, spoken word poetry, digital postcard, social media campaign, YouTube video, something to that effect. Our research team, we have Professor Ryan Wynn, who is with us today. Ryan um, is in the Humanities Department, so when it comes to this creative stuff, my background doesn't always drive me in this direction. So, so Ryan, uh, that's his, his asset on the team, advising in that area. Lincoln Peters, who was happy that day, but he has a frown on his face. <laughs> Travis Spice is here today. Lloyd Friesian, Apollonia Gomez is here today, and myself. So this is our research team that we have working on this project. So this concludes just the research portion. Um, next up, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about the system that we have here. But are there any questions so far just on the research and what our objectives are? Awesome. Oh, yes. Can you go back to your first couple slides where you showed those conversion efficiencies? Yes. <coughs> first few slides. Tell me when to stop. Okay. Oh, right there. Somebody asked me to take notes for him, so I missed a couple things. <laughs> Thank you. So, so the typical average conversion efficiency is 12%, and that's for the crystalline silicon. But for the thin film uh, modules, it's a little bit lower. Any other questions? Yep. How long do you think it could be before it could be insulated in the homes? You could do it today if you wanted. And um, we have a contractor here that I'm sure would be more than happy to talk to you about that. But as of does it make sense, we're going to get into that. And I'm going to show some calculations in the next few slides. Is that, is that what you're asking for? Yeah. Well then. One more slide, please. Yes. Can you just kind of summarize that again? I'd be more than happy to. Um, this, the darker colors are the maroon area, so that's kind of in these areas, have a high quantity of incoming solar radiation. In the lighter areas, kind of up here in Washington, going up into the northeast, those have a lower quantity solar radiation. Not to say that we shouldn't install solar in those areas, but it's just something to consider. And the yellow boxes here, we have all the reservations, 308. And if we focus on just 5% of those tribal lands, we can get 17,600 billion kilowatts per year, which really means in an average sized home, 9,500 kilowatts per year can result in 1.8 billion average sized homes. Since Dr. Fowler is here and more of the mega sized homes <laughs> <laughs> that typically use 24,500 kilowatts per year, it can still. Uh, estimate about 718 mega homes it can provide electricity for. Yep? Um, do you know how much is installed on the reservation? You know, the solar system? This the current? System? In the Menominee? Uh, well, not just on Menominee, but on other reservations? In total, no, because it's constantly changing. There are so many incentives right now that people keep on adding on, so I don't know exactly at this point in time for all the are reservations. More so in the southwest, yeah. which makes sense. So more so in this region. And there's institutions down there like University of Arizona that are partnering with those reservations for the data collection purposes. So is this the furthest no north that the research goes? 
yes. But we're hoping um, in a next research initiative to go even further north because we think the battery-based systems are really important. So we have connections to a set of cabins up north that have a battery-based system that we can collect data from that. So we're hoping to go. And if you have connections or if you have data that you're um, hoping for us to collect, we'd be more than happy to do that for you. I just have a question. You said, I think you said, as the temperature gets higher, um, there's less solar being able to be collected? So as the temperature increases, the power decreases. Um, but in colder weather, solar performs better. So yes, we do. And it's not to the amount that we want to focus on cold weather areas, but it's something to take into consideration. But solar irradiation is the number one thing. As long as we get that sunshine coming in, regardless of temperature, we really want the sunshine in order to get them to work. So the heat is the effect it has on components. Yes. So yep. Very efficient. Yes. So second part. Here we go. Can I ask one more question? Did yeah. You mm -hmm. Did you say that the snow on the solar panels increases the amount of power they collect? Snow in front of the solar panels. So that's going to increase the reflected solar radiation? So around it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is the introduction. I just want to show, highlight on the basics of how solar energy works. And the first step is with the sunlight, the solar panel converts the sunlight to the DC current. Um, the next step, it's tied down here into the inverter. So an inverter is going to convert the system from DC to AC. So now an inverter isn't always required. There's many, there's a few instances that an inverter would not be necessary. If you've seen on the side of the road, there's these blinking lights, and you might see that there's a solar panel attached to it. That's something that lights typically use DC electricity, because anything that's on for an extended period of time can use DC electricity. Also, uh, in farming, in fields, if you need a water pump, um, to, f to provide water for cattle, that's something that uh, a pump would be placed in there and be running continuously, and that's something that can use the DC electricity. But in this case, and for most common applications, we have an inverter that converts it from DC to AC. From there, we're taking it to a service panel, which can then be connected to the grid, and it's also connected to the home. So here it's providing solar, or providing energy for the home to power the appliances. Anything that's not used is sold into the grid, and there's that one-to-one -one credit back from the utility company. So this is just the basics of how the solar works. Where we are looking at a few different research objectives, we're looking at both types of panels. So in our 60 panels up here, some of those are monocrystalline and some are polycrystalline. Now research has shown that they perform about the same, but that's one of our goals in the researcher with our data is to verify uh, the performance of each of these. If you want to identify the difference, anytime you see a little white uh, diamond, that's going to be the monocrystalline, and it has a black color. And the polycrystalline is kind of shimmery, and it has more of a blue color to it. So if you're ever out and you see panels, that's how you can differentiate um, the difference between these two panels. What we also have going on here is we're doing an inverter comparison. This small box hooks onto the back of the solar panel, so unfortunately you won't be able to see these micro inverters because they're on the back of the solar panel, but we have 12 panels, each of them have their own micro inverter. With the remaining 48, we have central inverters. So there's two inverters, 24 panels per inverter, and you will be able to see these today. You just won't be able to see these because they're on the back of the panel. For our performance monitor monitoring, because we have two different types of inverters, one is through the Enphase Enlighten, and the Enphase Enlighten looks at the microinverters, so it provides performance data for the microinverters. So what it does is it takes the panels right here, there's connections to the communications, comes up to the internet, and I can access, or our group can access that data through an internet application. For the SMA, the Sunny Portal, this looks at the central inverter performance information. So again, data is collected. It's sent to the Sunny web box. 
similar to the previous one, goes up to the internet, and we have a sunny portal, and I'll show you both of those monitoring systems uh, after we get through this. The last thing that we have, oh, here's an example, Enphase Enlightened. So this is an example of one type of data that we can get from our microinverters. As you can see from here, they've been installed since uh, April, end of April, and they've created, produced about 1.91 megawatts megawatt hours, carbon offset is 1.32 tons. And there's some, uh, this is just one screen, there's a lot more information than this, but this is just one big takeaway for that smaller system. For the other system, the SMA Sunny Portal, we just got this one online last week, but it's been installed since the end of August. It's been generating electricity, we've been using it, but we've only been collecting data for about three days. And then there's also some additional information, how much energy it's created, CO2 avoided, uh, and that's with the Sunny Portal. There's much more information than this. As you can see, there's all sorts of tabs to go into. The next one is weather. So SMA Sunny Portal is also co collecting weather information. Wind speed, insulation, so that's solar radiation, module temperature, and ambient temperature. And this screen, this is just some charts that I pulled from this application. So this is showing ambient versus module temperature, wind speed, and solar radiation, which makes sense every day. It should kind of look like this. At high noon, we have a high quantity of solar radiation. This is across seven different days. So now getting into the cost, which is uh, the main motivation for investing in a solar energy system besides saving the earth, is, which is what we all want to do, but if we can't afford to save the earth, then that's a, that's a big step. So our current system is 16.2 kilowatts. So of that, we have a mixture of central inverters and microinverters, 12 microinverters, two central inverters. We also have weather station and performance monitoring. The total cost of the system, 46,800. It's not cheap. However, with focus on energy incentives, that's covered about 22%. So if you are interested in installing solar energy, you need to check out what incentives there are because there are lots of incentives, not only rebates, but tax incentives available. So our net cost is about 36,000. Using PV watts as a place to figure out the anticipated annual return, even though we know that they're not the best system, it's 2,400 we're expecting for an annual return. Knowing that solar panels are warranted for 25 years, we can expect after 25 years about 61,000, or more importantly, the return on our investment is gonna happen within 15 years. So anything after that, is just a bonus coming into the college. Any questions on this return on investment? What's the longevity? The warranty on solar panels is 25 years. Taking into consideration that's 80% at 25 years. So just like your car, you're going to have a warranty on it. That doesn't mean it dies after five years. It's just that's what it's warranted for. So it's warranted 80% uh, after 25 years. 80% of Full efficiency or something? 80% of full efficiency. Mm -hmm. So if it's rated at 1,000 watts, 80% of that is going to be 800 watts that we can expect after 25 years. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question that I want to get you out back, but it has to do with uh, lunar, lunar. It's like the same as solar. I don't know. I'm not familiar with that term. It might be. Because I know they have the little uh, lights where you put them in driveways and stuff. Light yes, that's solar power. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, like for their landscaping, they might use like either the flowers or lights or something, with, and you can see a small little panel on it, and that's going to be solar energy. There's a battery attached to that so that at night they can use that electricity. So my last slide here is just some things to consider if you are interested in investing solar. And the one thing that's most important, I hope if you talk with a contractor, this is the first thing that they say to you, is that you need to take inventory of your electricity consumption. Because it's smarter to invest in energy conservation and efficiency prior to investing in solar energy. So if you have a washing machine at home or a dryer or an old refrigerator, it would make more sense to upgrade to a more efficient appliance 
prior to investing in solar energy. But if, if after you take your energy inventory and you realize you have it down as low as possible, that, that would be the next smart step would be to invest in alternative energies. The next thing is to identify an ideal location. So the optimal tilt angle is at latitude plus 10 degrees. Our current latitude here is about 45 degrees, so maybe uh, the optimal tilt is about 55 degrees. But if you think about a normal, a typical house or a roof, a 55 degree tilt is extremely steep. And um, so this would be optimal, but that doesn't mean that uh, you shouldn't invest in in the renewable energy technology. The optimal orientation is south facing because that's where the sun is at all times, at least in the northern hemisphere. If you're located in the southern hemisphere, then the optimal orientation is north facing. The last one, optimal location is shade free. So we think, you know, this is kind of common sense, right? It should be shade free because the sunshine is what we need coming in. But at least from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., that's the prime solar window. And if you have difficulties identifying the, um, the shade, a contractor will typically have um, a solar site assessment that they can tell you what to expect for numbers throughout the year. Next is to shop around and get at least three quotes, keeping in mind that the entire system should cost between $3,000 and $5,000 per kilowatt, and that's considering economies of scale. So the more we buy, the cheaper it's going to be per watt. So on a smaller system, keep in mind that it should be about three to 5,000 per kilowatt. The next thing is to check out this Desire web base, and it's DSIRE USA. This lists all the federal incentives, the state incentives, local incentives, utility incentives, any rebates that are available. This site is very good at providing any information you need around the initial investment costs. And then lastly, talk to your utility company to figure out how the net metering works. So this term net metering, it, it just states that any, any excess electricity generated is going to be provided as a credit, one-to-one -one credit. But you just need to talk to your utility company on exactly how that's going to work. Um, but they are required to provide that one-to-one -one credit. And that's it. This is all I have for you. This, uh, this research is supported by NASA, as you can see here in this list, their, their grant number. But unless there's any other questions, I'd be glad to show you some of the equipment that we have and uh, kind of leave it as an open house format from here on forward. So if you want to help yourself to some breakfast or some more coffee, you're more than welcome to do that. But any other questions before we... Yeah. What are, what are, what, how much must power companies pay for the electricity you sell back to them? So it's a one to one. So currently here at the college, we pay 13 cents per kilowatt hour. So what we pay for it is what they're required to give back as a credit. Okay. There's a, a dairy farm in the northeast part of Shawano County, and they produce uh, methane from dairy cattle manure. Like biomass? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is that the power company for some reason can pay them a lower rate back. Could they do that to a homeowner too? Jesse would be a great person to answer that question. He's our contractor from Eland Electric. Uh, typically with utilities, there's different levels in, in size of systems and how they pay back. Uh, systems 20 kW and smaller, whether it's solar, wind, biomass, um, they're generally more lenient on where they'll pay you the retail rate for excess generated. Once you get into larger systems, especially biodigesters, methane digesters, they have uh, signed and negotiated power purchase agreements. At that point in time, the, di the bio digester is really no different than the coal-fired power plant or the nuclear power plant. So the utility buys that energy from the, di the digester from the farm, no different than they would buy it from the coal plant at their wholesale at the at the uh, wholesale rate or their cost, the avoided cost, which is. 3.2 to 4 cents per kilowatt hour. So they're, they're buying at wholesale so they can sell to retail to the end user. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. That's when it's a smaller system, they, they let you do uh, monthly net metering because um, for the majority of the majority of the public, we generate electricity during the daytime when we're at school, we're at work, we're not home, um, and the utilities can take advantage of that. So we're usually in a day or a monthly window, we're always over generating during the daytime and then we're buying that energy back at nighttime. Okay. On a small scale, they don't have a problem with that. It's, it's when you get into large scale farm type operations or large wind 
uh, farms. So that's where they, okay. they buy at wholesale. So that they can and they negotiate that rate with the individual seller. All right, thank you. Thank Good. you. Any other questions? Yes. Is there currently any um, estimate on what the value of a solar power system is on a home? You know, like if you were to sell your home, does it increase the value of the home? Does it decrease the value of the home? It definitely should increase the value of the home, but it depends on who's buying it. Sometimes people can be very intimidated by a solar energy system. Um, if, if you've done your research, you'll know that it's maintenance free. Uh, but if people aren't sure about a system, and for all you know when you're buying it, the inverter might be at the end of its life cycle. So there are some things to be cautious of that it might take a few investments, but overall it should be adding value to the property. And the nice thing, at least in the state of Wisconsin, is that your property taxes do not increase. So if you add the solar energy system or any renewables onto your property, the property taxes do not increase. So the property value, um, from a tax perspective, you won't be taxed on it. Any other questions? Okay, if you'd like to go on the tour, we're going to start going out on the opposite side here to check out the panels. So if you just go out this door to the right and take a few rights, if you want the tour, I can start there with the solar panels. <laughs> that was wonderful. Oh, thank you. I'm glad you could make it. <laughs> I had to probe pizza. I try. <laughs>Thank you. You're and welcome. One, one thing about the science of this. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the inverters converting the energy from, uh, from DC, DC to AC. To AC. Mm -hmm. And then um, if is there any, there's no way to store anything. That's why you have the grid. There is. If you don't have access to the grid, then it makes then sense to get a battery. And you okay. can, now even right now we can store it, but it doesn't make sense no, to store so it when you have access to the grid. Right, it's better to so if you don't have access, grid. if you're up in the mountains or you're up north and you don't have a grid, then you should definitely get a battery based okay. system for nighttime to, right, you know, to you. use it. You're welcome. <laughs>